welcome to Campus Conversations, a podcast where every other week we will sit down with guests and discuss how events or things going on in the city, nation, state, or world may affect our University of Nebraska-Lincoln campus. My name is Zach Wendling, an assistant news editor for the Daily Nebraska, and thank you for joining me for this episode of Campus Conversations. Today, I'm joined by director of the LGBTQA Plus Center and the Women's Center, Pat Tetro, to talk about the LGBTQA Plus community, its history, and how recent events are currently impacting the community. Pat, how are you doing today? I'm actually doing pretty well today. It's an interesting time to be alive. <laughs> Definitely. That is great yeah. to hear that you're doing well. Well, today, I wanted to start off kind of talking about your position at UNL and kind of the LGBTQA Plus Center. Can you tell me a little bit about the center and what it does for the UNL community? Well, the center actually, I think, is a very important component for the university. It provides visibility for the LGBTQA plus community. Plus, we also work with the larger campus community as well. Um, LGBTQIA plus identities have often been marginalized and are often invisible. And it's not common knowledge to the majority of people to be aware of the culture or terminology and concepts. So we can also work with people to help raise awareness about that type of information and answer questions for people. Um, and we also look at the intersectionality of identities. So we're trying to address the fact that LGBTQA plus people are in every other identity community and all of those identities are in in our community as well and so everybody's interconnected and so we really are trying to work to help create a more welcoming affirming and inclusive environment for everyone while also having that focus on sexual orientation and gender identity and on June 15th, of course, we had this major Supreme Court case that was a 63, rule, 63 ruling by the Supreme Court that held that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits on the basis of, on the basis of sex, also protects LGBT employees. Why is this so important today? Well, one of the areas where LGBTQA plus people experience discrimination is in employment. And so if you do not have the ability to get and maintain a job based on who you are, that makes it really difficult for you to have a, a living, provide yourself or your, and your family a home, um, be able to get food, um, access to health care if your employer provides insurance. Um, and so that ability to say that we deserve employment to the same degree that everybody else does um, was huge. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of the story or there's not more inequity that needs to be dealt with, but I, I really almost can't say how important it is um, but the way our society is, is you need work unless you are independently wealthy. Mm -hmm. And so that ability to get work and not that it will end discrimination, but it at least sends the message to people that it is not okay to have employment discrimination towards anybody who is part of the LGBTQA plus community. And technically it also protects straight cisgender people because it's also people of all sexual orientation and gender identities because it fell under the umbrella of sex discrimination and so anything that relates to sex discrimination also applies to straight and cisgender people so when those types of rulings come down they actually benefit everybody mm -hmm. And in this specific Supreme Court case ruling, according to the New York Times, it was a set of two kinds of cases, one that dealt with two that actually dealt with sexual orientation and one that dealt with gender identity. And before this ruling, including states like Nebraska, it was legal to fire someone based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. However, in Nebraska, um, there is a bill in the legislature um, that, sen that District 28 Senator Patty Pansing Brooks actually introduced in the past legislative session that would 
almost do the same thing as the Supreme Court ruling. Is that something that we're seeing with the legislatures too, of these extra bills, as you said, more things to go that falls to those, to those legislatures, state legislatures? Well, the Supreme Court ruling really only applies to federal courts and federal jurisdictions. And it also has limits for employee, employer size. And so even though it provides protection in a lot of employment situations, it doesn't uh, provide it everywhere. Also, Patty Pansy Brooks legislation includes housing and public accommodations. And so that would extend the non-discrimination protection and it would also um, help people in terms of being able to get and stay in housing and also be able to access public accommodations as well. Mm -hmm. And that can be a huge thing for a lot of people. And that would also um, help people be able to access um, things like restrooms and government services because we also have state laws as it is and we also have some cities or smaller municipalities that provide some protection mm -hmm. so in omaha there's legal protection for the city um, for lgbt people um, beyond that there's limited protection um, like if you have an employer with a non-discrimination policy or if you work for the city of lincoln or the city of grand island but you know, it's good to be able to have a job, but it's also good to be able to um, obtain housing mm -hmm. and also be able to use public services. And so we've heard people argue about the right to discriminate. And I would argue that your right to discriminate ends at the at where my right to not be discriminated against mm -hmm. begins. And, and again, that protects everybody. Um, because if we have a public environment and our government that says it's okay to discriminate against people because you don't approve of them, then basically that creates a situation where people have no consistency and can't expect even the government to provide the services that are supposed the government's supposed to provide for its people. And so, um, again, that ruling is a huge step forward. And I, I'm really excited about it. But at the same time, um, while it's really important to acknowledge our accomplishments and the good things that happen, it's also important to be realistic that this doesn't solve everything mm -hmm. and that there's still a lot of work to be done in a lot of different areas. And there's also a lot of injustice based on other types of identities as well. And so that intersectionality I mentioned in the beginning is also important um, because we do know there's racial injustice. And for people who have intersecting identities like LGBTQA plus people of color or LGBTQA plus people with disabilities um, or whatever that intersection is, those things still need to be addressed within our society. And really, the purpose of our government is actually supposed to be benign towards the people. So it is the role of the government to protect and serve the people. Mm -hmm. And so I, again, was really pleased to see that they made the right decision in terms of extending rights. And I totally get the, the textualism that was being used because I remember um, I'm going to say decades ago, thinking, well, this should fall under sex discrimination, but people didn't necessarily think that was the way to go back then because they were afraid of the very things that the dissenting justices said, which is that that wasn't the intent of the lawmakers at the time. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that if it is about sex, because if you were a different sex, nobody would have this issue. Um, so I, I'm really pleased to see that the jurists did really what they should do in interpreting the Constitution and also um, looking at it from the standpoint of like, how do we extend rights to people, not how do we take them away from people. Mm -hmm. 
And in kind of a completely different case in the past month, we did have on June 12th, um, the Trump administration, they finalized a regulation that virtually strips protections for transgender patients in healthcare. Um, it reverses the interpretation from the Affordable Care Act from 2010 that said that the basis to not discriminate based on sex applies to gender identity, can reverse that there. What is that kind of your reactions to that reverse? Well, it's not surprising on one level, but on another level, it's very disappointing that we have government officials who are trying, particularly for a group of people who already have um, challenges in accessing appropriate health care, to make it even more difficult to access appropriate health care and, and being in a pandemic on top of it. And so literally basically saying to healthcare providers and health insurance companies, well, you really don't need to worry about this set of people because we're telling you it doesn't matter to us. And, and uh, that is such a disappointment to hear from your own government that they don't care about you and that they see you as different and less than other citizens. Um, and it's also coming on top of other efforts and rollbacks by, by this administration um, to further challenge trans and gender diverse people having access to the same types of services mm -hmm. that other people have access to. Um, and, and not that everybody has equal access in our country, but literally we should. And I think that if you really look at the ideals that were laid out by our country, which we're an interesting um, country in that we have this great set of ideals, but it doesn't mean we always live up to them. And so this is a, a, an example of, we have this Bill of Rights, we have this constitution, we have these ideals as a country that at least I would like to believe most of us adhere to. Um, and we have a, a current administration that's basically saying, um, we don't care about you. We don't care if you have access to the things that allow you to have health care or be able to use the restroom that's appropriate for your gender identity or protections in like the contracts that are being made and that those people can't discriminate against you. So that actually, that court ruling at least helps when mm -hmm. it comes to employment. So um, yeah, so it's an, in, it's an interesting environment. Um, and I think that that's also part of the issue though, that um, in the current environment, I think that we also have a more aware public who is also more supporting of diversity and that supports people being able to access healthcare and the services that they need and to be able to get and retain employment based on your qualifications and your ability to do that job and rather than because somebody doesn't approve of you. Mm -hmm. And of course, the announcement of this reverse of the regulation came on the four year anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting in yes. 2016, which was mm -hmm. at the time the deadliest mass shooting, um, taking the lives of 49 individuals in Orlando, Florida. What does that mean to you in the middle of Pride Month as well for this regulation to come when, we, when it's a month of visibility for that as well? On one level, it's ironic. On another level, it's almost if there wasn't so many odd things going on in our country, it would be unbelievable. But the reality is, is that you have to believe it because it's happening. And I think that it really underscores how little this administration cares about, in particular, trans people and gender diverse people, but also about the LGBTQA plus community and their friends and family and people who care about them because I don't think that they did it because it's during Pride Month. I think they did it because they can and because their biggest concern is power. And so it's disappointing, of course, 
Um, I would prefer that whatever elected officials we have actually one, one of my desires is that every elected official be required to read the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. and that they would hopefully have the moral fortitude to actually live up to their oath of office. Yeah, and then when we're thinking about just diversity and inclusion, as you said, there is so much going on right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, with just many different things coming at once in 2020. How, what are some ways to be more inclusive and to be focused on diversity in this time? I think one way, I think there's different levels that people can function at. And I think the easiest level and the one we have the most control over is what we think and do as people. And so I think having a basic respect for every individual and realizing that what you think and how you treat that person is a reflection on who you are and what your beliefs are. And so whether we're knowledgeable or not, mm -hmm. I think we all have the capacity to have some empathy and to have respect. And in a virtual environment, and when we can't be next to one another, what are some ways to be focus on diversity and inclusion, even though you're maybe not seeing someone face to face, maybe through email, through social media, and just focusing on inclusion for everyone? I think part of that is also being aware of our language and being willing to listen and also being willing to be accountable for what we say. Um, because what we type on social media also is a reflection of who we are, even though I think sometimes people forget that um, just because they can and there's a little bit more of distance and anonymity that um, what they say and do has an impact. And so one is to become more knowledgeable. There is good information out there and that if you seek that information out, it's helpful to know that. But that means people also need to be able to distinguish between good and bad information mm -hmm. um, because we hear a lot of bad information from people who say that they're telling you the truth, um, but that doesn't necessarily make it true. And I really wish people would stop and think about the consequences of what people are saying. And I think that there's ways to so show support. So you see social media campaigns like You Are Enough, um, Black Lives Matter, um, and then there's extensions from that of what you have the capacity to do in your own community. But I also think one of the biggest things that people can do is where they have the ability to vote because we do live in a country that tries to mess with our votes, um, not some more than others. Um, I think that we can be informed voters and to exercise that right and responsibility um, when we're able to do that. Um, because I and I think that that also means knowing who we elect and letting them know where we stand on the issues. Um, part of the issue with that is they don't always listen to what the majority of people mm -hmm. say they want. Um, so it's incumbent upon us to try to have an impact in that way. And sometimes the, the most impact is at the local level but I don't think we can ignore what's going on at the state or federal level either. Um, and so part of it is being informed without being saturated by bad news, mm -hmm. because I also think that being saturated by bad news is extremely stressful. And I think that part of the divisiveness used within politics is because people have trouble managing it and then they distance from politics. And the more we distance from politics, the more politicians are able to do what they want um, without any scrutiny. Um, not that people don't say that, and not to say that all politicians don't do the right thing. I think there are a lot of really knowledgeable, hardworking politicians who are trying to make good decisions but it's challenging within the system that we currently have because it is so impacted by money. 
Um, and the more money you have, the more power you have. And that's a problem. And for trans and gender diverse individuals who maybe people may not understand their pronouns or may not know their pronouns, are there ways that people can go about being more inclusive to pronouns or respecting people's gender identity um, in today's world? I think one thing is that people can think about, does that really impact me, how somebody else identifies? And it's, it's like you wouldn't want, or I'll use I statements, I wouldn't want somebody trying to tell me what my gender is or what my ethnic identity is or what my age is and or whether or not I have a disability um, because they don't really know unless they know me really, really well. And so if you don't want people doing that to you, why would you do that to somebody else? Um, and, and yeah, so I, there's, a, I mean, I understand it, but I also don't understand it mm -hmm. uh, because I think that a lot of gender has been socially scripted and I think that people forget that and they think that it's like a really like life or death issue and the person that it might be a life or death issue for is the person who's having their identity denied. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that part of it is being open-minded, listen, but there's also, again, more information out there that you can get. Um, there's information online about how to use pronouns, pronouns.org. We have a trans ally pamphlet on our website. So they, under our resources, downloadable resources, there's a lot of information that's really useful to people. And one of the ones that could be really helpful is how to be a trans ally and it's short because it's a pamphlet. So um, I think that there's lots of things that people can do. And I think that over time, our culture has been encouraging more gender inclusive language. So I remember when I was growing up um, and people were upset because flight attendants didn't want to be called stewards and stewardesses. And police women didn't want to be called police men. And so at the time, it created this big furor mm -hmm. from some people um, because they also didn't like that men were getting, having longer hair, you know, lots of things that are like, this is, this is like a personal choice, yeah. not like something that really like impacts your life. Mm -hmm. And so somebody else's life that is. And so, um, now you don't hear people using that gendered language because our culture shifted. People, you just adjust over time and adapt. So some people may have never known that flight attendants were called stewards and stewardesses or that we now say police officers or postal workers. Um, so we've already degendered our language a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to continue to do that. So one of the things that I really notice is when people are staffing, that people will say manning, that they're going to man that. And I'll be like, is it only men? <laughs> you know, and if, and if it is, then technically that's accurate. But unless you're really limiting staffing to men only, mm -hmm. then you really should be using more gender inclusive language. So, and, and I don't mean to be like, oh, call those people out, but I do think that we can teach people how to use more gender inclusive language and call them into conversations about that. Or just when we're using language, make sure we're using gender inclusive language. So are you seeing someone versus do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Um, you know, saying human beings or souls instead of, or people, instead of gendering to mm -hmm. men and women or girls and boys. And it's not that those are inaccurate, it's just that they're exclusive because that's not how everybody identifies. And so not to say that you shouldn't use that language when it's accurate, but just be more aware that there's a lot of people who don't identify that way and that 
it's a little bit gracious and generous if you have the ability to honor that because most people just expect it. That's the privilege of, of gender. Um, if you appear the gender that people assume you are and you're okay with that, then you don't ever have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody started referring to you as a different gender than you are, um, all of a sudden that would be a different story and you'd probably be wondering if they were like normal, um, in quotes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that if you can put yourself into someone else's shoes, um, and, which may or may not be possible. So, mm -hmm it comes back down to that empathy and really thinking about how important is this that somebody conform to my ideas of what somebody should be like. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would say what's more important is that they not, because we all need to be who we are. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're thinking about June, it's Pride Month. Can you kind of break down what is Pride Month, why the month of June, and kind of just explain that for us? Sure. Um, one thing is, I think that just Pride in general is, is partly related to the fact that LGBTQA plus people have been encouraged to be invisible and have experienced a lot of oppression. And so Pride is about being proud of who you are as a person. And when people aren't proud of who they are, then that causes a lot of um, negative consequences, including depression and anxiety and hopelessness. And so it helps to love yourself, which is easier to do if other people can see you and love you for who you are. Mm -hmm. And so part of what Pride Month is about is recognizing who we are, where we came from, what's going on now and where we want to go. And so, cause it helps to know your history. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that's really important for any community to be aware of what their history is. And it's not like we're taught our history. So we have to dig for it and educate ourselves. And then other people, because it's not mainstream information also need to educate themselves because one of the things I think that happens with any marginalized community is people think, well, that doesn't apply to me, even if they're like, well, that's okay, but I don't need to know anything about them. Um, that's marginalization because we're all connected to straight cisgender people. Um, and so you're our families and our friends and our coworkers and our employers and employees. And it's like, if I thought that about you, that I didn't know, need to know anything about you, you would feel really um, not cared about. <laughs> and so um, if you care about people, you need to be able to be willing to learn about who they are. Um, it's also connected to history. Um, not that this was the beginning of LGBTQA plus rights um, and working for LGBTQA plus rights, but it's what be, has become known as what, what became the, the kickoff point for gay, the gay rights yeah. movement. Um, so, and you'll, you'll have seen about the Crompton um, mm -hmm riots as well in San Francisco that happened a little before. Um, and, but this actually happened in New York City um, at the Stonewall Inn. And so um, it became a very well publicized event. And then it became a historical event because people started recognizing it every year after that. And so it used to be illegal to actually dress in a different gender clothing in New York City. It was also illegal to have gay bars, um, but not that they didn't exist. Um, but what happened was um, the police busted the Stonewall in just one too many times. And on this particular night in June, um, they decided they 
had enough and they weren't going to take it anymore. And so um, for three days afterwards, there were people marching on the streets um, and a lot of people got arrested um, and it, it became just one of those events that became part of our history. And um, the following year, they did a gay pride parade um, mm -hmm. and yeah, you know the rest of the story. So, and of course, many people may not know about the Stonewall riots that occurred June twenty eighth, nineteen sixty nine, um, which is now when we reach June twenty eighth. That'll be fifty one years since the Stonewall riots, and this year, fifty years since the Christopher Street Liberation Day march in New York City that you mentioned. Um, right. And so, we're seeing these recollections of the Stonewall riots to today of people had enough of what was going on and that led to rioting that led to change. Um, and at the Stonewall riots, we had black queer women who were That's leading right. there. Can you talk about that of these women um, and just the leaders from that? Well, the terminology at the time was really gay. Mm -hmm. um, and then lesbian kind of got added in because um, gay men and lesbian women are different. And then, um, of course, over time, visibility for bisexual people also uh, became an issue. And there have always been trans people, um, but they were not necessarily talked about as trans people um, and, and in terms of it being gender identity. And so um, basically, trans women of color really were a key part of the movement for having mm -hmm. rights for the LGBTQA plus community. And that's true with the Crompton riots in San Francisco as well. It was really about the police, well, it also had to do with the new ownership of the diner, mm -hmm. but um, it, it had a lot to do with trans people trying to be who they are and live their lives, um, even if it was in a segregated, marginalized district, and then having that impinged upon. And you do get to a point where if you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to lose. And so um, really a lot of trans people, women of color in particular, I think, um, were the shoulders on which we mm -hmm. and people like Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera for the Stonewall Riots, they helped with the Stonewall Riots and really they helped just in this movement and they have since been given that recognition. And with what's going on today in our country, many people have been saying on social media six words, um, and quote, the first pride was a riot, unquote, and it's really amplifying and standing with those black voices. How has pride in the year 2020 really changed to support those Black voices this year? I think over time, the marginalization of trans people within our own community has been diminishing. And I think that knowing that history has made a huge difference. And so recognizing that and also recognizing like Black Lives Matter, which was actually started by three queer Black women, um, is, is so essential because there's so many contributions by people that we have no idea of what their identities were or are. And so that recognition is so important. And ironically, um, trans women of color are the most likely to experience violence. Um, so that intersectionality and our paying attention to it is really important. And yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know that the president of GLAAD, um, Sarah K. Ellis, this year, she made the message that GLAAD will be standing with those Black voices, and much of Pride this month has stood up 
for those voices. Um, I want to transition to, of course, the day that this podcast is out is June 26th, which is known as LGBT Equality Day, which marks five years since Obergefell v. Hodges went before the Supreme Court, which is the five to four ruling that ruled that same-sex marriage was legal in the United States. Can you talk about now, five years later, where have we come in those five years on LGBT Equality Day? Well, the United States is still standing um, because there were people who really thought that it was the end of the world, Mm -hmm. Um, but it was um, a long time coming. Um, There'd been people, like I remember hearing about the first same-sex couple who applied for a marriage license being like in the early 70s in in Minnesota. Um, And I think that Prior to that, people probably did their own civil unions. I remember hearing once that, um, I don't know if this is true, but I think there was an article written about it um, that basically said in the 13th or 14th century, the Catholic Church performed same-sex marriage ceremonies. Um, So a lot of this stuff is like people want to have those formal commitments um, and and whether it's a civil commitment or uh, one that's based on their faith, mm-hmm. um, that's really important. And I think that having your family recognized, having those relationships recognized, makes such a difference in our social society. Because being in a committed relationship with somebody, even if you've been living with them for years, people see that differently than if you say we're married. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that social support that comes from that recognition, um, in addition to the legal support and obligations that people have, really have an impact on how people can navigate society. And I think that it really helps make legitimate same-sex relationships. Um, so that's, that's so important that, that we were able to do that. Um, there have been, like, there had been progress made in recognizing, like, civil unions or domestic partnerships with, like, domestic partner benefits. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was very interesting because, Um, you would have to have lived together for a certain number of years and you'd have to have bills in common. Mm -hmm. Yet you could be in a marriage and maybe get divorced, say, three times um, or more. And you don't have a waiting period. You just automatically get that person on your insurance. And so this is is a, a civil contract that actually helps support families. And over throughout history, one of the the ways that people have undermined different groups of people is by interfering with their ability to have families. So having the right to have the government recognize that you have a family is vitally important because of all the things that are the result of that recognition. And transitioning back to kind of closing this out, we are now with the Supreme Court decision to help with employment discrimination, to go against that um, and provide those protections, as well as the same-sex marriage ruling and the Stonewall riots as well. That's been 50 years of really a change for the gay liberation movement. Um, Do you see this momentum, just those first 50 years to what's next? Do you see there being a momentum there in the United States changing? I certainly hope so. Um, Because of the current political environment, um, I have hope, but but I am not certain on how things will, like, progress. Mm -hmm. But I also think you can't make people go back. And I think that we do have more rights guaranteed us now than we did in the past. And so I think we can only go forward. It's just a question of how we do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when we're thinking about how to celebrate pride now, um, 
in a virtual setting now that we are in 2020 with the global health pandemic, but also just thinking besides just June, how do you celebrate those identities? What are some ways to focus on that visibility going forward? Well, there's actually lots and lots of virtual events. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's different ways that people do it, whether it's attending events, um, learning a little bit more about our history, um, whether you have rainbow flags flying, um, and, and there's lots more identity flags now too. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's visibility is really, really important. And I think that um, a lot of it again comes down to what's meaningful for you. I do think this is a challenging time because as human beings, we are social by nature. Um, so not being able to do things together and um, like feel free to like hug people and just kind of be out in public um, mm. is a challenge. Um, but I think that we also need to be grateful for what we do have. And so the fact that we can do virtual prides, that there has been so many things going on, um, that there is more intersectionality being recognized, um, that people are more open about who they are, that those are all really important things. And really the best thing people can do is be happy. Of course. And at UNL, I do want to say here that UNL's non-discrimination policy does include sexual orientation and gender identity for that as well. Um, and kind of closing out here with LGBTQA plus students, faculty and staff who go to UNL, what are some ways for them to find support, whether through the center or anywhere else for them to find those resources and really find their community at UNL? We actually on our website have a resources page. And so in it are campus and community resources. Um, if they're looking for community on campus, we have a number of listservs they can join. Um, we also have social media, so Facebook pages, um, Twitter, um, Instagram. And we also just recently started a new listserv called Husker Pride um, to, so that we have a better opportunity of reaching out to um, in particular, like LGBTQA plus faculty and staff, but anyone can be on it. It's just that we also have a listserv for LGBTQA plus students. Um, on Facebook, we have a grad group. We also have the RSOs that are LGBTQA plus um, identified on our web pages. So reaching out to the LGBTQA plus resource center, whether that's for on campus or in the community resources is a good way to get information. And there, there's also a pamphlet on our website, which actually I think says it's Nebraska, uh, but it's actually Lincoln resources. So all of the groups that we are aware of that exist in Lincoln are in that pamphlet. Um, just a little caveat that there are no real funded resources in Lincoln. So just being aware that all of the groups are peer support, volunteer um, groups, um, but that there's lots of different groups. So hopefully there's something that someone feels connected to and um, can reach out to and, and find a community. Um, because it's really challenging to be able to find community, especially when you're not supposed to go interact with people in person, um, but people can do that through the internet as well and through social media. Um, there's also a commission on the status of gender and sexual identities, so that's also another group that people can reach out to. So there are resources. Um, it, it just requires somebody um, kind of taking that step to reach out and try to find what resources might work for them. Mm -hmm. And then Pat, kind of close out today. Is there anything else you have to say about Pride Month 2020 and just Pride throughout the rest of going forward? I kind of wish I had all my like accoutrements from work because I'd like wave a little flag. <laughs> but um, I, I just think that 
people just need to be proud of who they are. Um, if you don't love yourself, work on it um, because we're the best people to take care of ourselves. Um, and the more we love ourselves, the easier it is to love other people. So be happy, be proud. And thank you, Pat, so much for joining me today. And to those of you tuning in, if you have any ideas for what guests or topics you would like to see on this podcast, be sure to stay up to date with our social media platforms, but also feel free to comment below on this video or contact us directly at news at dailynebraskan.com. And Pat, thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, thank you all for listening and be sure to join us for the next Campus Conversation. Thank you, Zach. It was my pleasure.